Hi, welcome everyone. We'll get started in just a minute. Welcome, everyone. My name is Sarah Carr. I'm Chief Knowledge Broker for OCTO, which stands for Open Communications for the Ocean. And we're very pleased to have you here today for today's webinar with Katharina Frashal Santos uh, from the University of Lisbon on taking climate smart ocean planning and governance to the high seas. Um, before we get started, uh, I wanted to let everyone know that uh, we'll first have Katharina's presentation, which will be about 30 to 40 minutes, and then we'll, we'll have dedicated time for question and answers afterwards. We welcome you to send in questions at any point throughout the webinar, although we'll ho hold substantive questions till the end. Um, but you can send in questions through the question and answer panel. You can type them in uh, or you can type them into the chat. It's a little bit easier to moderate with the question and answers, but I'm also gonna be monitoring the chat uh, for questions as well. Um, with the chat, we highly encourage you if you have information on this topic to share, if you have responses to anything Katarina said, if you have additional information to share, resources, questions for other practitioners, um, we welcome you to put them in the chat and make them available to everyone on the webinar. Um, we encourage you to use it. Just please keep it on this topic and professional. Um, and <clears throat> I also wanted to recognize that we'll have two additional panelists who'll join us um, at the start of the question and answer period. Uh, Tundia Gardi from Sound Seas and Baird and & Associates and Larry Crowder from Stanford University who are also involved in this project. Um, so I'll go ahead and turn it over to Katerina now. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Sarah. I'll just try to share my screen. Okay, it should be on now. Can you can you just yes, confirm yes, that? Yes, it looks great. Yes, it is. It looks great. So hello, everyone, and welcome to this webinar about climate smart planning in the Southern Ocean and beyond. And it's great to be back at Octo's webinar. So thank you so much for hosting us. Um, we are big fans. <laughs> and I would like to acknowledge everyone that has been involved in the work that I will be presenting today, but especially to Tundi and Larry, who will join us and share the floor with me. Um, and also flagging and acknowledging the institutions that have been supporting us, namely the European Union through the European Research Council and the Portuguese Foundation for Science and Technology. So today we will unpack a number of different concepts and topics from what climate smart planning is to what marine spatial planning is to why the Antarctica to a new project that will focus on these topics and to a recent publication in science. So let's start with marine spatial planning. So marine spatial planning emerged about 40 years ago in the context of conservation planning in Australia and shortly after in China with marine functional zoning. And since then, it has expanded all over the globe, being currently under development in over 100 countries in their exclusive economic zones and spread almost all ocean basins. So simply explained, marine spatial planning is a practical way to organize the use of the ocean in space and time and to manage interactions among human uses like fisheries or tourism, shipping, and between those uses and the marine environment. And so the ultimate goal is to reduce conflicts and promote synergies and balance human development with ocean conservation. And that is why it has been recognized as an important tool to support the achievement of global sustainability goals. And while many people think of marine spatial planning as a combination of maps and zoning schemes, and they are part of MSP, MSP is actually much more than that. MSP entails creating a shared vision 
maintaining a living process that is continuous and interactive, and if properly done, will never end. It requires effective monitoring and evaluation, and it optimizes ocean health to continue benefiting people. So a key point that is important to make is that marine spatial planning is not the same as marine protected areas planning or marine conservation planning. MPAs are areas set aside to protect part or all of the enclosed marine environment. It can be a species, it can be a habitat, and they can range from fully no-take areas to allowing some sort of ocean use, but they always focus on fulfilling protection and conservation goals. On the other hand, marine spatial planning is multi-sectoral, it is multi-objective, and while ocean health must be at its core so that it is sustainable in the long term, and while it can assign priority areas for conservation and support MPA's implementation, it offers a vehicle for a more structured integration of environmental, social, and economic objectives. This said, both marine spatial planning and marine protected areas planning and uses of the ocean and ocean ecosystems and conditions will all be affected by a changing climate and will need to prepare for it. So the most recent IPCC report has shown that climate impacts are increasing both overall and in the ocean, and it is important to address these impacts for a long-term ocean and human health. And so we do see that our ocean is continuing to getting warmer. It is getting more acidic with impacts for important ecosystems like coral reefs. Extreme events are becoming more frequent and more intense, increasing danger at sea. Winds and currents are changing their, their circulation patterns and all of this is causing changes in the structure and functioning of marine ecosystems with species redistributing and losses of biomass and key effects for the billions of people that rely on the ocean for their livelihoods and subsistence. And so we know that different uses have different uh, will be differently affected by different drivers of change and that this will change with region and context. But what we do know is that the ways that humans use the ocean and benefit from the ocean will definitely continue to change. And this brings us to the need for a climate smart planning and particularly for climate smart marine spatial planning. So Climate Smart MSP is MSP that integrates climate knowledge, is flexible and adapts to changing conditions, and supports climate adaptation and mitigation actions. And the need to move towards Climate Smart Marine Special Planning has been recognized in the last few years, both at a scientific level and at the policy level. And in fact, in late 2022, the UNESCO and the European Commission jointly launched a roadmap that identified climate change and climate change marine spatial planning as one of the six key priorities for MSP development globally. Still, practical guidance was needed to support and is needed to support marine managers and planners on how to actually develop these marine this climate smart marine spatial plans and put them into action. Because indeed to date, no case study worldwide from the 100 nations that are developing MSP has integrated climate change considerations comprehensively into the process. And so a group of scientists and practitioners have identified 10 key components that are intended to support decision makers on how to act towards climate smart MSP development. And some of these key components are more operational in nature, being practical channels to action, and others are more conceptual and work as foundational principles underpinning the entire planning process. So the first operational pathway 
pertains to integrating climate-related knowledge into marine spatial planning, identifying expected climate impacts, risks, and opportunities. And this requires knowledge and data across discipline scales and knowledge types. And at the forefront of existing approaches, we can find modeling tools and spatial explicit vulnerability and risk analysis. The second operational component pertains to developing proactive future-looking plans that explore future scenarios and can be used to stress test the ocean, the, the plans themselves. So with climate change, there is an urgent need to anticipate the changes ahead. And MSP needs to explore trajectories, forecasts, and visions for the future based on the climate-related knowledge that we collected previously. And here, a valuable technique is scenario planning. But even with the best projections, we will always need to have some adaptive capacity. So the third key operation component pertains to promoting adaptive and dynamic planning to ensure that marine spatial planning has the ability to face uncertainty and adapt to moving biophysical features and uses. So most uses will need to follow marine moving resources. And for that reason, creating management boundaries that move accordingly to such resources and conditions allows for more effective management. And that is why dynamic ocean management is viewed as a very important way forward. Very much linked to this, there is the point of balancing flexibility with legal certainty to address the tension between the human need for predictability and moving biophysical resources. So while MSP needs to be designed for change, it also needs to ensure legal certainty for ocean users, and this is challenging. But it is not impossible. And for example, in air traffic control, decisions are made about relocating airspace in near real time based on environmental conditions. So there will be ways to do this. And finally, uh, the, uh, the final operational pathway pertains to identifying ocean-based climate solutions and prioritize space allocation to support climate mitigation and adaptation actions. And this can entail multiple pathways from nature-based approaches to area-based management of industrial activities. MSP can support the expansion of renewable energies in the open ocean. It can support the protection of low carbon habitats and it can support ecological and social resilience to climate change. But for all those operational pathways to take place, we need to first change the way that we look at ocean management and planning and governance. And so first we need to prioritize ecosystem health as a primary strategy for marine spatial planning decision-making, acknowledging that to be climate smart, MSP needs to sustain the ecosystems on which it relies. This means that we must stop confronting conservation with development, and we need to recognize conservation as an enabler for ocean use and benefits to society in the long term, as well as the baseline strategy for all the spatial allocation decisions. Another thing that we need to do is to understand system interactions and dynamics to promote an, in, an integrated and systems view of ocean planning. So ocean planning needs to be much more than marine planning. It, it has to be coastal planning, watershed planning, land-based planning, high seas planning, because they are all interconnected. So we must recognize complex social ecological interlinkages and cross biophysical, social, economic, and political boundaries. We must also reinforce the importance of social knowledge, equity, and change in co-developing sustainable ocean plans Equity in ocean use is being increasingly challenged by climate change, and in many situations, social challenge changes are more dramatic than ecological ones. So the social dimension really needs to be enshrined into the MSP process. We need to align policies 
for MSP and climate change to support the integration of climate change into MSP and effective coordination among different policy arenas. Traditionally, there has been a lack of mutual, mutual recognition between marine spatial planning policies and climate policies, and this must be overcome. And finally, and very importantly, we need to build common narratives together with policymakers, the private sector, civil society, and other integrated ocean management stakeholders to change perceptions of ocean sustainability and climate change. So we need to focus on co-developing and co-creating visions, knowledge, capacities, and solutions, and translate this idea that we care for nature, not because we profit from it, but because we need it for our well-being. So all of these 10 key components are deeply interrelated and they are um, designed to function best as a coherent whole. However, we recognize that there are context dependencies. And for that reason, in some cases, in some contexts, some components will be more prevalent than others. And these components are also intended to provide a checklist to support the assessment of the level of climate smartness of existing and future MSP initiatives. So we have the guidance, we have the political will, but we are lacking an example of what climate smart marine spatial planning could look like. And that brings us to the Antarctica and the Southern Ocean. So the Antarctic region is critical to the functioning of our planet, influencing sea level, regulating climate, driving global ocean circulation, and for that reason, while it is a remote region, what happens in Antarctica has impacts around the globe and affects the billions of people that rely on the ocean for their well-being. At the same time, Antarctica is being increasingly pressured by climate change, with, for example, records of sea ice loss that are increasing at alarming rates. It is also being increasingly pressured by human activities, such as commercial fisheries and tourism. And work has been developed for many years to protect the Southern Ocean. For example, the Commission for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources, CAMLOR, has advanced several conservation-focused initiatives, from biodiversity hotspot identification to the actual implementation of large marine protected areas. However, because Kemler's focus is limited to marine living resources, in order to manage human activities comprehensively, including tourism, science, shipping, we need a broader approach to engage with the wider Antarctic Treaty system. And that is why we have argued that the time is now to build on this work and take a broader path engaging all relevant parties and stakeholders in managing the Southern Ocean and addressing a wide range of interests in an integrated way through climate smart marine spatial planning. And we have made this point in the recent paper published in Science. And so, this paper was intended to inform the annual Antarctic Treaty uh, meeting, consultative meeting that took place in late May this year. And at this meeting, the idea of climate smart marine spatial planning was going to be discussed for the first time as an official uh, agenda item. In fact, an information paper was submitted to the meeting by the delegations of Portugal, Canada, France, Italy, and the IUCN. And the paper was very short. It was a short piece, but it highlighted the opportunity to pioneer climate smart marine spatial planning in the Southern Ocean. And so this paper was backed up by the science paper that was timely published a few days before the meeting started. And so we argue that the Southern Ocean is the ideal place to trial climate smart marine spatial planning. But why, you may ask? Well, first, it is one of the regions 
on the planet that faces most ex extreme climate impacts together with the Arctic. It has an existing governance structure that is strong enough to implement marine spatial planning in international waters, the Antarctic Treaty System. And it has decades of marine scientific research on biophysical processes, human uses, and climate impacts. So the Southern Ocean can be a model for the integration of climate change into comprehensive marine spatial planning, creating an example to inspire areas both within and beyond national jurisdictions on how to do it. Indeed, marine spatial planning is being developed all around the world, but it has never been implemented in areas beyond national jurisdiction. It has only been developed and implemented at national or local levels. However, now with the new High Seas Treaty, the BBNJ agreement, we have a legal framework for enhanced cooperation in areas beyond national jurisdiction and a mandate to adopt area-based management tools which marine spatial planning is. So this creates an opportunity for MSP expansion from national waters to international areas. At the same time, the agreement itself focuses on the need to protect, preserve, restore, and maintain biological diversity in ecosystems, including to strengthen resilience to stressors, including those related to climate change. And this will require planning, spatial planning that fully integrates climate change. So having a case study, an example of how the integration of climate change into comprehensive marine spatial planning could look like in an internationally managed area would be extremely timely, novel, and relevant. And to that purpose, we provided four points to be considered by policymakers at the Antarctic Treaty Consultative Meeting. The first, first point pertained to diversifying data and knowledge types, um, which pertains to the first operational pathway of Climate Smart MSP that focuses on the integration of information on climate-related impacts, risks, and opportunities across discipline scales and knowledge types. And in the Southern Ocean, prioritization could be placed on identifying the distribution of key ecosystem processes, human uses, and areas that are most, most prone to social and ecological variation. The second point pertains to ensuring a forward-looking gaze. This is in line with the second operational pathway of climate smart marine spatial planning and exploring plausible alternative futures to anticipate upcoming challenges. So in the Southern Ocean, the involvement of all relevant interested parties in MSP scenario building and visioning exercises would be key, and parties to the Antarctic Treaty could develop a process for bringing these groups together. The third point we made was that we needed to enable dynamic area-based management tools in international waters. And so ocean plans have traditionally focused on those static uh, boxes lacking flexibility, but climate change will require more flexible approaches. And to enable interested parties to be more forward-looking and flexible, a Southern Ocean Data Network is needed to coordinate data management and allow for data sharing agreements for climate smart marine spatial planning. And finally, the last point pertained to centralizing ocean health, and this aligns with several of the key components of climate smart MSP. And in the Southern Ocean, it is important to identify areas where organisms are more likely to survive in adverse conditions, as well as protecting vital ecosystem processes and to support ecological resilience to climate change, but also to other stressors. And this has already been started by Kemlar. And what we recommended was that parties continue to prioritize the protection of habitats with the greatest potential to serve as climate refugia and provide climate mitigation and adaptation solutions. So 
In general, the message was well received at the meeting, and next year we will provide parties to the Antarctic Treaty with more information on how climate smart marine spatial planning could actually look like in the region. And this brings us to the final topic of our webinar, which pertains to the work that we will be developing over the next year and the years ahead under the new project plant on planning for sustainable ocean use in Antarctica under global climate change. And so project plant is funded by the European Union through a starting grant from the European Research Council. It will be developed over the next five years. It started in March this year and it, it will run until 2029. And it is based at the University of Lisbon, Portugal at the Science Faculty and Mari Center. And what the project will do is basically identify, even investigate and explore the benefits and challenges of developing a sustainable, comprehensive, climate smart marine spatial planning initiative in the Southern Ocean. And to that purpose, it has five building blocks, all of them deeply interconnected, all of them using a variety of methodologies from natural to social sciences with the goal of developing a case study for the first time of what climate smart marine spatial planning can look like and what a large scale marine spatial planning in an internationally managed area can look like as well. And so the first building block pertains to existing conditions. So where we are now in terms of ocean use values and vulnerabilities in the region, and this is the basis for any marine spatial planning process. And it will include a variety of methodologies and ex special explicit analysis and is aligned with several components of climate smart marine spatial planning. The second building block pertains to imagining future uses, so where we want to be in the future of sea use management in Antarctica. And there are, again, several ways to do this and to explore imagined futures. And we will take a mixed approach using modeling together with uh, investigating perceptions and preferences of key actors. The third building block pertains to which climate actions can be supported through marine spatial planning and how marine spatial planning itself can adapt to an upcoming changes, either climate related or others. And the fourth building block focuses on a governance and policy analysis. So identifying the factors political, social, economic, that will either leverage or hinder marine spatial planning development and implementation in the region. And finally, the last building block focuses on transferability of results. So exploring how all the lessons learned from developing climate smart planning in Antarctica can be applied to the rest of the world, either other internationally managed areas in the high seas or marine spatial planning initiatives being developed at the national level and developing codes of conduct, conduct and best practices guidelines are part of the plan and there will be a strong focus on dissemination actions targeting a variety of audiences from the scientific community to ocean users, pr practitioners and decision makers. So, such a big project requires a big collaborative effort to be well developed. And in addition to the core team that is based at the University of Lisbon, the project has a large and expanding advisory board and network of collaborations with people from different countries and with different expertise from climate change to ocean planning to the Southern Ocean. And we welcome any, everyone who's interested in establishing collaborations and work with us towards this big goal to get in touch because this is a big effort and we do want it to, to succeed. And that is it from my side. Thank you so much. And I will now give floor to two dear friends and mentors with whom I have the pleasure of working for many years now and that are part of the project advisory board. Dr. Tungi Agardi and Professor Larry Crowder. And I will hand it over first to Tungi and then to Larry. 
and then we will have time for questions and answers. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Katharina. And Tundi, I think we can hear from you now. Great, thank you. Um, good to um, listen to Katharina's excellent um, presentation. And I'd like to start actually by um, just mentioning that Katharina is extremely humble um, in the way that she presents her, her work. And I think she deserves <laughs> a little bit more credit than what she's giving herself in terms of um, both the work done to date and the incredible potential for this um, ERC project, looking at um, climate smart MSP in the Antarctic region um, in the future. So um, I, I say this because uh, Katerina mentioned that um, a group of collaborators developed the 10 principles and principal components of climate smart MSP. And you know that was under Katerina's leadership. And, it wasn't that 10 people, you know, contributed uh, to the idea. It was that Katarina had the idea and we all contributed in some way, some small way to helping her flesh that idea out a little bit more. But um, she really deserves a big round of applause for the incredible work that she's done so far and her leadership um, while she maintains this um, humility um, and you know, great ability to work um, across uh, multiple different kinds of teams of people. So let me just start by saying that. Um, I also just wanna make a few um, reinforcements maybe of the message um, that came out very clearly, I think in the webinar. Um, one of the messages being that uh, the Antarctic region is presenting uh, an incredible opportunity to the world, um, not just to get it right in Antarctica, but to serve as a model of how we might get it right in other places. Um, it is a unique constellation of enabling conditions in Antarctica. Um, there is no other uh, multilateral regional seas agreement um, that has conservation as its core, so we have a condition where we have uh, essentially a regional seas um, situation with the Antarctic Treaty, and, and we have many countries working together cooperatively um, to ensure that the Antarctic um, resources and space is secured into the future. But alongside that, of course, we have Camelar, which is unique in its um, multilateral focus on the conservation of living marine resources. Um, and so having those two agreements side by side present a situation where um, there is a common agenda, there is a framework um, for working together, um, and Camelar has made significant progress in conservation of living marine resources and um, will um, and for sure continue that progress, um, setting up marine protected areas, um, working on fisheries management and so forth. Um, however, as Katerina mentioned, the focus on conservation of living marine resources is not a broad enough focus to be able to ensure that the use of ocean space in the Antarctic region um, is truly sustainable because sh both shipping and tourism really need to be considered um, in an integrated way um, and with climate change um, you know, at its core. So developing this climate smart MSP presents an opportunity to go broader, building on the um, excellent work that Camelar has already done and using the framework that exists with the Antarctic Treaty um, I think there's this incredible potential, um, which will soon be realized <laughs> with uh, Katarina's leadership um, trying to uh, basically um, develop some different scenarios for the future and provide uh, treaty members with a set of options on different ways that they might allocate um, space and resources. Um, as the climate change affects the Antarctic um, system. So um, 
Katarina mentioned that um, MSP is essentially um, organizing a way to organize in time and space. And I think we have in the Antarctic situation, um, both time and space challenges. <laughs> and by that, I mean, uh, in terms of time, we're very much uh, forced to confront the situation that everything is changing very rapidly with climate change and at both poles. Um, there's such rapid change happening that it, it's imperative that climate changes be considered in all, all decisions that are made um, with respect to resource and space use. Um, and that that time frame of change um, is, is there's kind of a mismatch between that time frame that's existing with climate change um, changing everything and the time frame that has existed to date in terms of the way Camelar has been um, uh, developing its rationale for protecting different parts of the the Southern Ocean region. Um, that process has been deliberately slow and careful, um, and it's been a very good process in terms of achieving results, but um, the pace needs to be picked up <laughs> due to the climate change um, changes that are happening and due to what that means in terms of um, both the ecosystem health of the Antarctic region and its ecosystems, but also um, what kinds of opportunities arise um, to different countries in terms of um, being able to use the Southern Ocean region. Um, so there's that time challenge, but there's also a space challenge. And Katarina mentioned this very eloquently, so I won't belabor this, but uh, the space challenge is that we need to consider not conservation as a kind of special interest or as a as something that um, can be done alongside um, the allocation of um, uses for maritime industries, but it needs to be the core of what is done in terms of uh, allocating use. Um, so all of the possible uses, both existing uses and future uses um, of this region need to be taken into account um, as scenarios are developed for marine plans and as decision makers get to look at trade-offs and make intelligent informed choices um, on the future that they, they want for the Antarctic region. So uh, this project is um, extremely exciting because it presents the opportunity to do this in a unique place where the frameworks exist. Uh, there's a common agenda for getting this right. Um, there's a recognition that this uh, time is of the essence um, and something needs to be done very quickly. Um, and Katarina's um, science paper and the recent meeting has really, I think, galvanized attention to MSP as a possible um, tool for for making this happen, a climate smart MSP, I should say. Um, but I want to also just end my comments by saying that um, having this project take place in the Southern Ocean, while it is a unique situation, there aren't inhabitants um, in Antarctica. Uh, it, so it presents a, a kind of interesting um, case that um, people might think is not very applicable to the rest of the world, but actually there is a huge swath of areas beyond national jurisdiction. Much of the world's world ocean um, could benefit from this kind of approach. And by field testing this in the Antarctic region, I think this will provide uh, a model for the future in terms of how climate smart MSP could be applied in, in BB and J or AB and J um, region around the world. So with that, um, I'll end and say thank you very much to um, Sarah for hosting the webinar and to Katarina for involving me, however marginally, <laughs> in this project. Um, and I'll turn it over. I, I'm not sure that Larry is able to join, but I'll turn it back to you, Katarina. Yeah, and I don't, I don't see Larry. But thank you so much, Tundi. And for, for everyone, this is Tundi Agardi of Sound Seas, and we really appreciate her being on to uh, speak about this project. Um, Larry is not able to join Katarina. So uh, we'll turn it back over to you. 
Also, would you be able to share your last slide, uh, which had the email addresses, Katharina? There were several people who asked because they were interested in contacting you guys. Okay, and then we, let's see, with the first and... Let me try to do it in a different way. Yes, yes, way. I was wondering if there was a <laughs> sort of fast way to get to the end. Yes, definitely. Uh, mm, uh, okay, so if Larry cannot join, maybe we, we go to the questions and answers. Okay, sounds good. Um, um, did you want just, yeah, I'll give you a second. Um, and then while sorry. you're doing that, I just wanted to remind everyone, you can send in questions to the question panel, um, as well as in the chat. You can post things in the chat, too. I'm almost there. Okay, no, it's good. It's good. Okay. Okay, wonderful. All right, thank you okay. for, for putting that up. Okay, um, and thank you again, Tundi. Uh, so we'll start with a, a question that came in during the webinar. Um, thank you for the well thought out presentation. Can you share with us some concrete examples of integration of social considerations, such as justice and equity in marine spatial planning? That's a great question. Um, I don't have a straight answer to that especially because uh, attention to, to social justice and equity considerations on MSP and on ocean governance generally is a relatively new area. So I believe that for, for the last few years, we, had, we started to hearing more about it and more examples, uh, mostly at local scale, I think. Uh, but before that, there was not really that uh, attention to the topic, and specifically, specifically on marine, in, on the topic of marine spatial planning, even just integrating social the social dimen dimension beyond ocean uses and the economic relevance of those uses was somewhat limited. Um, so I don't think that I can give you a really good example of how a marine special plan has integrated uh, these aspects so far is something that we need to work towards too, as well as the climate side. Um, and so I want to make, I would like to, to also make the point that we have been talking about climate change and the challenge of climate change and that it poses to marine spatial planning. But just developing regular marine spatial planning without climate change considerations is a challenge in itself. And it faces a lot of um, problems and limitations from uh, the need for monitoring and, and evaluation to the integration of stakeholders to political issues that end up defining if the plan is implemented or not. So we know that we are bringing a new level of compact complexity to the process, but it's also something that we really need to tackle because the changes are here and will continue to be here. I don't know if Tundi wants to add something, if if you know of any good example that I am not remembering uh, right now. Um, I don't, can you hear me? I... So we can hear you, Tundi. Oh, okay, good, sorry, I don't, yeah. Didn't know if, if I was um had was master of my own <laughs> my own mute button or not. Um so yeah, the only thing I'd say, Katarina, is I think there are examples where the equity issues and the the involvement of um, local people are um almost guaranteed in processes where people are involved early and are part of the visioning for. MSP, and this requires um, a bit of work on the part of um, marine planners because uh, it's much easier to to plan at a coarse scale, at a large scale, um, and not involve a lot of stakeholder groups. Um, it's much harder to get to the to the fine scale or the local scale um, and hear from from representative stakeholders. Um, but there are, I think, examples where they are, they manage to do this in a hierarchical fashion, where you 
where you get the involvement of people from the ground up. Um, and that really drives the process. It's not um, kind of throwing a pin to the uh, to the stakeholder groups um, so that they'll accept a plan that's developed from on high, but rather um, a plan that's grown uh, from the bottom up. Um, and there are examples of this, uh, for instance, in the UK, where um, marine spatial planning takes um, place at different scales um, and the involvement of local communities and actually setting the agenda on what they want to see the marine uh, spatial plan achieve. Um, it is a way to ensure that um, not only our voice is heard, but that there's active, um, true participation in the process um, throughout. Um, and and to your point, Katarina, that it's we're not talking really here about conventional MSP. We're talking about climate smart MSP. Uh, the involvement of local people, local communities, um, local stakeholders. Um, can really not only um, give information on how climate change is affecting ocean use and how people are deriving benefit um, or are at risk um, from ocean use, um, but also um, can really uh, help frame that, that vision for the future um, vis-a-vis -vis climate change. In other words, what people want to see happen with regard uh, to as, to the oceans changing um, changing face due to climate change. So I think um, there are examples of this. It's really hard to achieve that at very large scales. Um, and uh, this is why um, working in Antarctica is actually going to be a bit easier to do this at the large scale because of the, <laughs> the lack of local communities and um, and inhabitants. So there are, of course, stakeholder groups um, with all of their diverse interests. Um, but uh, this idea of having to work at different scales um, isn't so pertinent at, in the Antarctic nor in the uh, BB&J um, situation. Okay. All right. Thank you, Tutendi and Katharina. Um, let's see. Another question that came in, um, how can we contribute to further MSP marine spatial planning development in these areas as scientists and MSP experts? I know I'm not sure I heard the entire question, Sarah. So how can we contribute as scientists and MSP experts? That's correct. To to further marine spatial planning development in these areas. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it, it would it will depend on the area. Uh, if we are talking about this specific um, project and an area, we uh, would be most happy to establish collaborations and, and, and integrate more people and more expertise to join us on, on working on all of these building blocks that will start to be developed uh, from now on during these five years. Um, one of the things uh, that Tuni mentioned and that I also mentioned on the presentation for this particular project and the work that we are trying to develop in the region is that some of the people that are linked to the advisory board are also people that have roles in, in decision making and in participating in these uh, big uh, Antarctic Treaty meetings and so we have a collaboration that allow us to get the science into the policy realm. And so in this specific context is something that we can do, of course, that we have to be very careful and very um, intention, intentional on the science that we provide so that it really uh, is uh, credible and sound. And so that we are, we keep the door open for the decision makers to want to hear from us and, and not the other way around. But in other areas, specifically in other international areas, um, I, it will depend on how the decision making framework will be developed. In what regards national marine special planning processes, it also depends on the structure in place for each context. 
uh, and each country, because normally marine spatial plans are developed for uh, a country's exclusive economic zone or to a more uh, local level, um, a specific municipality or region within a country. So there is not one straight answer that can uh, include all the, the, the different contexts where MSP is being developed. Okay, thank you, Katharina. Um, another question um, is, the Southern Ocean is more pristine than other locations. How will the findings from this be integrated with areas where chemical stressors, industrial and municipal discharges, and physical stressors, such as plastic materials, are more prevalent? Well, that's also a great question. <laughs> I think that adds to the complexity of the, of the area that we would be trying to manage. And yes, uh, the Southern Ocean is very pristine in, in regards to some pressures, but I think it's not as pristine as most of us think of it. So um, we have, again, a variety of contexts that is, uh, we have multiple, we have countries where the marine space under national jurisdiction is highly pressured and that leads to a certain type of decision making and vision and objectives and marine spatial planning. And we have other areas that are more pristine and where conservation many times is more um, prevalent and, and the notion that we need to keep the, the ecosystem healthy and functioning. So I would say that uh, all the aspects of pollution and high uh, human pressures on the environment and environmental impacts will be an added layer of complexity and additional challenge to deal with. Uh, but the way to integrate climate effects into planning and to support adaptation and to support climate action will not, will not be that different. Yeah. I don't know if Tundi wants to add anything. No, I, I don't. Um, I assume that there's more questions. Just to say that I think you're right, Katarina, that um, I think the process is the same no matter what the conditions. And I think the properly kind of scoping what the set of stressors are or pressures that are affecting a place and also what the trajectories are for uses, um, you know, trends in uses and how they might be um, expected to change in the future will influence uh, the development of any marine plan or any option uh, for several marine plans if those are developed. Um, so I think I think the process is equally applicable even in degraded areas where there are chemical stressor, stressors or eutrophication or other issues. And I think your point that you made in the webinar, Katarina, can't be emphasized enough when we're talking about marine spatial planning, climate smart marine spatial planning, that's truly effective. We're really talking about not just marine planning, as is conventionally done in most places that are doing MSP, but it's also linking that to integrated coastal zone management planning or coastal planning, uh, watershed planning, uh, even land use planning. Um, it's critically important uh, if the goal is to, you know, maximize ecosystem health. Okay, thank you, Tundi. And thank you, Katharina. Uh, yes, we do have a we have a bunch more really good questions. So we'll try and hit it, at least a couple more. Um, one that came in, um, can you share a bit more about the tenure aspects in Antarctica? Sorry, Sarah, I lost you. Oh, about can you sorry, can you share a bit more about the tenure aspects in Antarctica? Like in terms of probably sea use tenure? Okay, I don't know if I really get, if I am, if I can answer that. I'm not even sure that I'm really understanding the question. I'm sorry. My okay. internet, internet is failing a bit. <laughs> yes, okay, we'll move on. But um, I think it's um, hi historical use and who has rights to use natural resources in Antarctica. Okay, sorry for this. Based on historic use. Um, yeah, 
I think it's a very complex region. Um, so I don't know if, again, there's a straight uh, forward answer to that. There are some uses that have been developed there, like commercial fisheries for long. And now there's this uh, increase in tourism. And tourism is really a concern at the at this moment. And it's one. it was one of the topics that was really discussed at the last Antarctic Treaty Consultative meeting. So I would say that in terms of ocean uses uh, with strong impacts on marine ecosystems and coastal ecosystems, they would be the two most prevalent ones. Um, but the Antarctic Treaty system is very complex and there's all this complexity even about if it is some countries perceive it as a, total, a complete internationally managed area. Some countries have claims on particular regions. Those claims are suspended. So it's it's complex. So um, so I don't even, I don't know if I can actually reply to that properly. So I will leave this uh, answer as more open. <laughs> okay. Uh, and we got um, more clarification uh, that the land tenure, ice tenure, they're referring to who owns the land and ice. Right. Yeah, I think that links to the, the claims that the original um, countries, consultative parties to the treaty. So there's a, the, this small number of countries who made claims to the territory, the region, and those claims were more or less suspended uh, with the Antarctic Treaty. But um, it's not a completely black and white situation. So, okay. All right. Thank you, Katarina. Um, another question. Um, they said, thank you for the presentation. Are you using Earth system climate projections for planning? Are these integrated with habitat suitability modeling? And what scenarios and will scientific data needs emerge that can provide guidance to researchers? Thank you. That that was a question that I was expecting. <laughs> so we will we will still decide and define exactly what type of modeling we will use. But our first approach will be to to use species distribution modeling using the most recent climate um, couple model inter uh, intercomparison project phase six. So SNP. Uh, six data, environmental data, and try to to understand how the species are distributing and how they will be potentially distributed in, redistributed in the future with climate impacts depending on the projections. So we will start there and then certainly we will see that we need much more data on some specific aspect and we'll build collaborations from there and, and try to get the information needed from there. Okay. All right. Thank you, Katharina. Uh, I think we have time for one more. Let's see. Uh, there, there was a question about asking about transport sector issues. And are there, um, was, are you addressing the transport sector issues related to shipping lanes and development in melting ice areas? I imagine that the sector as well as others are taking advantage of this fact. Yes, definitely uh, maritime transportation is one key sector that we will try to together to the discussion. So um, the goal of marine spatial planning is to put on the same table all the different sectors that either are working on the region or plan to work in the future or have interest on, on that specific area being managed. So. Uh, Transportation is, of course, uh, also an important sector. And we will try together the with this project with one of the things on, on the building block of developing scenarios and, and the one on characterizing the, the current situation. We will try to uh, gather the, the perceptions and the views from all the different sectors and try to frame them and see how they um, how they uh connect to each other and how the conflicts emerge and current and future and one of the things that we will do to to address that is to use a participatory mapping approach to really get 
the perceptions of everyone into uh, one same same system. Hey, thank you, Katharina. Um, and we have a lot of more great questions that we're not going to be able to get to, but I will provide them to you and Tundi and Larry so that you can see them. And um, I think everybody has your email address now so they can contact you off, offline as well. Um, I'd just like to thank you so much, Katharina, for being here and presenting today and for this great work. And thank you, Tundi, for sharing uh, your uh, your knowledge with us too and for your participation in this project. And I wanted to thank everyone for being here today. And um, we're glad you could make this webinar. And thank you for your interaction and the questions and in the chat. And uh, we hope you can make future webinars. All right. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you so much, Sarah. And yeah, we would be happy to, to answer any other questions by email or different uh, or direct meetings. Okay, great. And for those of you who sent in questions that uh, we didn't get to, again, I, I will be able to provide them to uh, Catherine and Tundi. All right. Thank you, everyone, and have a great rest of your day.